everyone and welcome back to What a Barb, a Pollen podcast. I'm Ovs and this week I'm joined again by Lecky Beans and Veg as we reach our final Pollen rewatch of season two. Almost. Almost, almost, we'll get there. Have we got a treat for you, lovely listeners? <laughs> as we reach our final Pollen rewatch with an asterisk next to it and a disclaimer. Yeah, disclaimer being it's very long and we, we're tired and... We just have a lot to say. <laughs> We're curating your listening experience, I guess. To clarify, we have decided to split this rewatch into two episodes. Firstly, because there's so much that we want to dig into. And secondly, well, I think we could split this episode into like 16 separate parts and we'd (laughs) still be sat twiddling our thumbs waiting for season three to drop. So Yeah, we've got time. We've got nothing but time to kill, babe. Literally. (laughs) It's a double, double special. But most importantly, how are you all doing? I'm well. Beans, I'm just sad that we don't do like a video podcast because listeners, she is looking quite the treat today. Yeah, we love Beans. <laughs> Thank you. In the style of an outfit analysis, Beans has some lovely <laughs> loose curls hanging down in front of her face. She's got that great thing with the eye makeup where you do a little bit of highlight to make your eyes look bright and good. And she's channeling the 1990s. She looks like a 90s baby spice. <laughs> yeah, well, when we're recording this, it is hollow weekend, so I wanted to do a little something something. And uh, I also added a bow to my hair as brown oh. something. Unfortunately, you can't see it that well. In honor of our Lord and Savior, our shining light, Penelope Featherington. <laughs> Yay! Amen. Mm-hmm, Lucky, mm-hmm. my love. How are you doing? You love Halloween. You ready for it? I love Halloween, but I don't have any plans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to watch Hocus Pocus at some point. If only we had more time, I would watch it with all of you. Maybe yeah. we can make some time. We mm-hmm. can watch it after Halloween. Halloween year round. Yeah. In the coming months. The coming months. Vegetable, how are you doing, my love? Fine. Is the weather shit back home? It is. I had Halloween plans yesterday as well. It was a murder mystery party at my friend's house. He got COVID. So oh, there we go. Oh, no. Well, you have um, some Greek delight. I do. My parents went on holiday with Ops. No, they didn't, but they were in the same place. <laughs> I wasn't aware they went on holiday with me. <laughs> Did you see that creepy couple behind you that was there? No, I got Lukumi, which is Greek delight, which is similar to Turkish delight. So I'm with you in spirit. Yeah. Speaking of Greece. Yes, where in the world is Ops? Well, it's not that exciting. I'm back on Corfu. I was on Corfu the other week. I'm back now, but I will be leaving on Wednesday. I think. Where are you headed? It's a good question. I don't actually know. And I think what I've decided is I can get a bus to either Athens or Thessaloniki. And I think I'm going to flip a coin and let the coins decide. <laughs> oh my God, I could never. <laughs> Just take it from there. The Libra man that I had relations with also flipped coins to make decisions for himself. <gasps> yeah. How did that work out for him? Poorly. Well, we know how it worked out. He like ghosted me. <laughs> <laughs> we never found out. <laughs> That's so brutal. He ghosted me, that bitch. <laughs> well, I'll tell you how the coins work next week i'll tell you how they fall but before we get started on our episode lecky can you take us through the breaking crumbs of the week so lecky what have you got for us hello barbkin firstly in season three news last week we mentioned that fan account at romp romance on twitter had uncovered some new casting information well they're back at it again this week and they are on fire honestly <laughs> But they've shared that Lucas Aurelio will be playing an unknown but recurring character in episodes directed by Tom Verica. As a reminder, Tom Verica will be directing episodes 7 and 8 of season 3. At Romp Romance also speculated that Ella Brucaleri could be joining the cast as well as an actor known as James Bradwell. We did a little digging and found that Bridgerton actually appears on a list of James's credits in a casting announcement from earlier this year for a play at none other than the Park Theatre. Could Lucas and James be joining the Lord Squad? My new favorite favorite term. <laughs> it hasn't been confirmed yet, but it would delight me if they did. Well, squad forever. <laughs> Once again, a huge thank you to at Romp Romance for some truly excellent pollen sleuthing. We tip our bows to you. Moving on, Delray Books and Republic of Tea are currently running a Bridgerton giveaway where three lucky winners will receive a copy of the official Bridgerton Guide to Entertaining, as well as a selection of Bridgerton themed teas. The giveaway is open to US residents only and will include the info in our show notes if you're interested. Mm-hmm. The aforementioned Bridgerton Guide to Entertaining was released this week. Pollen fans will be delighted to hear that Penelope and Colin are mentioned in the book, specifically in a recipe for a peach and bourbon smash, a drink directly inspired by Colin's iconic line, there are no gemstone mines in Georgia. My favorite, my favorite. (laughs) It's a good one. The book also features a whole ton of other recipes, so go check that out if you're interested in entertaining like it's 1814. (laughs) Always. Nicola Coughlin was spotted on the set of Doctor Who this week. It seems as though she was filming scenes 
from the 2024 Christmas special, mm-hmm. which is so exciting. We can't wait for an official announcement of Nicholas casting and to find out more about the character she'll be playing. Also, shout out to our listener on Twitter who was excited about this particular crumb just so that we could have something to talk about this week. We also <laughs> were excited to have something to talk about, specifically the fact that somehow people were able to capture this scene from three different angles. My God. Oh. Bridgerton filming leaks could never. I love that it's got to the point where we're using other fandoms filming leaks as our news. Although, Lecky, yeah, you and I have both been in the Doctor Who fandom in our pasts. Yes, mm-hmm. Doctor Rose Forever. It was like returning home, mm-hmm. suddenly wishing I was back in the Doctor Who fandom where they get <laughs> plentiful leaks. <laughs> yes. Nicola has also donated items for the Choose Love Boutique, which is now open in London. Sales mm-hmm. from the boutique will help raise funds for refugees and displaced peoples across the world. Mm-hmm. Nominations are now open for the UK-based What's On Stage Awards. The awards, which are both fan-nominated and fan-awarded, cover a range of categories. Bridgerton fans, this is your call to action to go and nominate cast members who have appeared on stage this year, including Luke Newton, Luke Thompson, Adjua Endo, and Martin Zimhongbe, among others. Jonathan Bailey and his fellow Travelers co-star, Matt Bomer, were both interviewed about the show in The Telegraph. Speaking of fellow travelers, earlier this week, Paramount Plus held an event in London to celebrate the release of the show. Mm -hmm. The event was attended by a couple of familiar faces, including Martin Sim Hongbe and Jaritha Chandran. Nikesh Patel confirmed in an interview with the Graham Norton radio show that he will be starring alongside our Viscountess, Simone Ashley, in an untitled comedy. We look forward to hearing more about the project, including a title, in the coming months. (laughs) Definitely. In more Simone news, it has been confirmed that she will be performing a duet with Zayn Malik in the upcoming animated feature, Ten Lives. Mm. And congratulations are in order to Bridgerton composer Chris Bowers, who has been nominated in a number of categories at the Hollywood Music and Media Awards for his work on Queen Charlotte, Chevalier, and The Last Repair Shop. In strike news, the situation between SAG-AFTRA and the AMPTP has been very tense this week. A sticking point this week seemed to be the Guild's latest AI proposal. At the time of recording, the AMPTP has has finally delivered a counterproposal to SAG, and it sounds like talks will again stretch into the weekend. To provide context once more about the importance of AI protections, in an interview with Sky News, Succession star Brian Cox discussed the use of AI in the industry, saying... I think AI is a human rights issue. It's not just a union issue. He went on to say that he believes AI is actually a form of identity theft and is very, very prevalent at the moment. He also voiced his concern that AI could lead to the exploitation of young actors, highlighting the importance of the union's demands toward AI protections. As always, we continue to hope the union's demands are met and the ongoing negotiations are successful. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. In lighter news, this week will mark one year since Bridgerton Social Media shared the infamous miss you do not count clip across their accounts good news you say (laughs) <laughs> now, normally we'd find this clip distressing, but what was exciting was Nicholas' comment beneath the post, which read, ooh, how things are going to change. Did we think we'd be here a year later commemorating an old clip posted on social media? <laughs> no. <laughs> but it's still just exciting to think of the implications of Nick's comment, and so we are happy to reminisce and spiral all over again. Once again, it just reminds us that season three isn't a collective hallucination that we're all <laughs> investing in. <laughs> At some point, it will actually appear. <laughs> Mm-hmm. We'll just get casting news for years and years to come about new people who are in season three, but it'll never be released. It's a jam-packed season by the sounds of it. <laughs> <laughs> Until then, like, shall we get on with our episode? Yes. Thanks, Lucky. Well, here we are. Looks like we made it because we have Looks finally like arrived at our final preliminary watch. Not quite final. 208, the big finale. Part one. Almost final. You know. We've been inspired by The Crown and we're releasing in two parts yep. to spread out our content. Also, do we think, yes or no, will Series 3 be in two parts? Yes, that's a good question. No. I think it will be. I think it will be. Dear God, I hope not. I hope so. It'll be so much fun. No, because I don't know if I'm just convincing myself, but I've like taught myself into it being a good thing because I feel like they will fit quite well into like two distinct halves. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think it will. It'll end when Colin discovers she's whistled down mm. or they have that moment in the church or wherever it'll be and that'll be it Bean you're waggling your finger at me what's going on in that beautiful head of yours (laughs) dislike it just release it all at once (laughs) no but then it's over and then I miss the olden days when episodes release one at a time I will say that I don't care which way they release it I'm fine either way as long as we eventually (laughs) get it but I don't think they will split it into two parts because I feel like unlike The Crown or even Stranger Things which kind of had long almost feature length episodes 
episodes, I feel like. Yeah. Bridgerton, the format is slightly different. Yeah. The tone of each episode is slightly different. So I don't think they... And it's like a fluffy romance where the stakes can't be that high. Yeah, and as much as there is that built-in break with the carriage scene or the discovery of Lady Whistledown, I feel like they won't split it. But mm -hmm. if they don't have a lot of content for next year, there's yeah, a possibility. Exactly. Yeah, but need. at this point, I don't think they will. But I wouldn't be super shocked and I wouldn't be super mad either. I don't care. Give me my pollen. I'm not going to complain. But like I say, we're here to fill the time up. So Lady Veg, why don't you give us our episode summary? Dearest gentle listener, thank you most sincerely for coming on this rewatch journey with us. In the first half of our esteemed season two finale, <laughs> Anthony battles with his feelings for Kate versus his um, fear of loss. Um. And Benedict contemplates his future in the arts. Theo calls it quits with Eloise to avoid ruining his life, and a now awake Kate rejects Antony's offer of marriage and plans a return to India. Portia and cousin Jackerington finalise their scheming plans as Will tries to alert Colin. Elle's scandal seems to be pretty much immediately resolved, and she and Penelope <laughs> clash over her obsession with Lady Whistledown. And the Featheringtons host... A ball. Spoilers, Veg. Spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, let's get started. Lecky, why don't you kick us off? So this particular episode opens with some heroic rescuing of a certain maiden by a certain Bridgerton brother, and it's pretty dramatic. Antony is in so much pain in this episode, it's pretty heartbreaking. And so it made me wonder, will Penn and Cullen be in such dire straits in episode eight of their season? Will they follow the formula we've seen in Saphne and Cantony seasons and only come together in the final minutes? Or will season three break with tradition? And as we've touched on in prior episodes, see Paul and United fighting some not so insurmountable force together to get their happy ending. I think we've all convinced ourselves it's the latter, like the drama is going to be not about them. Don't bring me into this because every time you guys are like, no, it can't happen in episode seven and eight. I'm like, are we watching the same show? But, like, I think we just want them to be happy. Yeah, I think we want it to be happy. I see your point. That's not the show. I think it's going to be dramatic. I, I'm hoping that, okay, first of all, I'm changing my sales a little bit. I'm coming over <laughs> to the off side of the, yes. the spectrum. where to the dark side. We'll probably get something. I still don't think it's going to be at the wedding, but we'll probably get something that's like, mm -hmm. that hasn't been resolved from episode seven that takes literally half yeah. the episode to fucking resolve yeah i'm just hoping nobody gets hurt and i think if somebody does get hurt <laughs> they might flip it and reverse it and it might be colin that gets hurt Scratch that. Reverse it. So i don't think it'll be as bad as this start with someone being injured because kate's injury ties back into the actual book itself yeah she yeah. does actually get severely injured mm -hmm. it's slightly different the way it works out but that kind of event is a key part of their story yeah so i don't think that would necessarily work in a pollen story. Right. And from what we learned from Saphne is they can still be married and still be together, but still have conflict. It's not that they're not going to get together into the last yes. one. It's like But for Saphne, the conflict comes from within their relationship. And I feel like in yeah. season three, it could come from within their relationship, but there's also a chance that the conflict could still be that outside force where pollen think they might not be able to stay together because they think that someone is going to threaten their happiness yeah. or ruin their lives or maybe put Penn in jail. Chop a head off. Also, not to get too into the weeds, but Kate's injury here is part of Antony's journey. His deepest fear is that his fear of loss, his fear of death. Yeah. So he, he fears that Kate will be taken from him the same way that his father was. Yeah. So for Colin, you have to think about what his fears would be in season three. And I think that Ovs believes that <laughs> Penn might hand herself into the queen or something <laughs> like that. But there's a chance that Colin will think that he's going to lose Penn. So that conflict won't necessarily come from within the relationship. It could come from outside of the relationship. That's more true to their story, that idea of yeah. Colin against the world. That's what I was thinking. That's more at the core of, of who they are and their story that's getting told. It might be slightly different instead of like Colin like wrestling with whether or not Penn wants to be with him at this point. Yeah. It could be, will Penn be taken from him or something, you know, by somebody. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I can handle that. <laughs> I just want the drama. We know that they're going to end up happy in a little epilogue. They'll skip off into wherever, but I want mm -hmm. the drama. I'm sure it'll happen. But speaking of drama... Now, normally, we'd be opening our episode to the dulcet tones of Julie Andrews, but something seems to be missed. What's going on, Like, Where the hell is she? Oi. I don't even really know who she is. 
Well, after Kate's traumatic rescue, we cut to tons of people strolling about and complaining about their missing scandal sheet. And how do we know about this? Well, Eloise's maid declares to her walking companion that it has been a week since Lady Whistledown last published. For book fans, you may recall that Sophie is a fan of Lady Whistledown. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> I'd also like to point out that the other maid in the scene is wearing a capelet, just like the one Eloise's maid is wearing, though hers is in a shade of yellow. This suggests to me that this outfit is meant to mark their status as ladies' maids, though I think it's still possible that they wanted to make her slightly more distinguishable than the other maids we see in passing throughout the series. As always, we're clowning to the end and probably completely wrong about this theory. I'm right there with you, like, one way ticket to clown town, no problem with her. I'm looking for her. Be it a maid, be it Cressida Cowper, everyone seems rather restless without the latest episode from Whistledown. Quite like how we all were last year when we would desperately wait for the next post on the Bridget and Instagram page. Remember those days, everyone? <laughs> so our girl really did follow through and she did stop writing. The tons of people are wondering where she is and so are we. Have you managed to track her down there, Kate? Her lovely pen is in the Featherington drawing room, reflected in the window as she intently listens to Prudence, who hopes that Lady Whistledown will pick up her pen again so that she can write about her forthcoming nuptials. Best of luck with that, <laughs> Prudence. <laughs> and I just want to say that I absolutely love the beautiful shot of pen here, even though she does look rather troubled with her face mm -hmm. reflected in the window. Beautiful. And if we think back across the past two seasons, we've often found Penelope happily perched by the window. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something she's frequently told off for doing by Portia. As a, yeah. What was that phrase? Befreckled beggar. <laughs> a befreckled beggar. And I think it represents how she's an outsider to the world of the Ton, but she's also their observer. And the window is also her connection to the world outside her home. And she's stuck inside a house, and that's kind of her connection. And it's also deeply tied into her work as Whistledown, whether she's by the window watching for gossip or waiting for the delivery boys. And we're usually there peering out with her too. And I really like how in this moment, she turns away from the window and leaves the window and we don't get to peer outside. Almost representing how she's turned away from her work as Whistledown in the aftermath mm -hmm. of everything that's happened with Eloise. Mm -hmm. And we all know we get that gorgeous shot of a pensive pen by the window in mm -hmm. season three. So we love pen by window. Pen seems to be in a poor mood as she sadly remarks that Lady Whistledown may be done ruining the lives of others. Obviously, the situation with Elle is weighing heavily on her. Of course, her family pay no attention to her, so they completely miss Pen's comment, which in more observant hands would have been a hint about Lady Whistledown's identity. Yeah, she does seem like, like she's turned away, it seems, from Lady Whistledown, and we see her thought process, or we can imagine it coming out here. It, mm -hmm. It's got very on top of her, like like you said, Lecky with Eloise and what she had to do. But also I think she could be sort of considering the other impacts, what she had to do last season and stuff with risking Madame Delacroix's career. And yeah. it's just interesting yeah. to consider all her motivations here and how these are going to swing drastically by the end of the episode. And that's not to say that by the end of the episode she doesn't care about any of that anymore, but it's just like the pendulum is swinging and it, it's all going to go yeah. down this episode. <laughs> that's a good point, Veg, because she's given up Whistledown. She didn't want Eloise to interfere with Whistledown because then Pen would have to stop Whistledown if she was exposed. And she was trying to avoid that. She was trying to come up with a solution that would allow her to continue her work, protect Eloise, and keep everything still secret. But it's weighed so heavily on her that she's decided to quit Whistledown, which really shows how deeply upset she is about what she's had to do. She yeah. snapped her quill and she's sticking to it. Whereas, like you say, at the end of not this episode, but our next rewatch, we'll see how Pen then turns back to Whistledown. Mm, yeah. And to Eloise, that's going to be a slap in the face when yeah. Eloise finds <laughs> out that she's. Because in the confrontation, jumping ahead of it in the confrontation pen says i gave it up for you and at the, yeah. then at the end of the episode she picks the pen straight back up yeah. and elle must be like well couldn't have meant that much to you but yeah. i think what we'll see here is that pen made this decision out of love for the people in her life but by the end of this episode she's not going to have anyone left exactly and all she's going to have is whistle down yeah. and it doesn't help matters that pen hasn't been able to see eloise in a week pen tells her mother that she wants to go see her friend but portia reiterates that she's not to step foot in that household so not only is pen feeling guilty she also has no idea how how Eloise has been doing and she doesn't really have any idea if Eloise has done anything more reckless mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. if she's still continuing with her search yes. uh, but I do love the little hug she gives as she crosses her arms yes, in indignation same crosses her arms yeah <laughs> it's such a cute move she's so annoying she might be feeling pretty unhappy but she looks great she's doing it wearing <laughs> a cute 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 yellow dress full lace it's probably the dress I'd be most likely to wear just day to day make it a bit shorter it's a sundress great yeah. for summer it's a lovely shape it's a similar yellow to last Last episode's dress which was just perfect we love that buttercup mm. i love the curls in front of our ears i love oh beans your curls <laughs> in front of your ears as well <laughs> she looks so good it's actually quite distracting yeah it is <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but yes, Pen has lovely, cute curls falling down in front of her ears. It kind of reminds me of the elves in Lord of the Rings. Oh yeah, a little bit. Cute. She's going to go in for those tight little baby curls next season. Yes, so she is. And our time with Yellow Pen is limited. We said last week that we're going to miss it. Aww. Now we're closing in on season three. Mm-hmm. I don't think we're going to get much yellow, but let's enjoy, oh, let's enjoy it while we have it. Please yeah. just give her one bombshell yellow look. It would be so fitting if Colin saw her in like a yellow outfit and you just finally saw everything in his eyes. Whatever. Yeah. Anyway, it's fine. Yellow flowers at the wedding is my compromise. That's true. Yeah, I'll take a little little glimpse of yellow at their, their Maybe wedding. Maybe Colin will wear something yellow. Yeah, he could wear yellow. I want him head to toe in yellow outfit. <laughs> big bird. Big bird of the Regency era. <laughs> You're like, hey, Pen. He'd carry off. He'd carry off. Also, to revisit flowers for a second, and one of our listeners actually mentioned that Penelope is a flower name. Mm-hmm. Um, so kind of like Violet and Hyacinth and even Eloise, they all have flower names. It's kind of like Penelope belongs in the Bridgerton bouquet. Oh. Might have been a little foreshadowing there, potentially. <laughs> And after Portia probes Cousin Jack about whether he's close to finalizing the deal with Colin, aka whether he's been swindled yet, she declares that she's decided to host a ball. The name of this ball, you ask? The not-so-creative yet aptly named Featherington Ball, and a less-than-impressed pen snarks, how original! Got a bone to pick with Miss Featherington here, because that line is a fan favourite, but it does always make me laugh, because the Harmony Ball from last episode was actually called the Bridgerton Ball. You mean on the on the little cards? <laughs> yeah. yeah! I tell you what, go across the square and tell that to Violet's face, will you? <laughs> Just like you dragged her naming of the kids in episode one. She's not in a good mood. The Bridgertons can do no wrong in her eyes because yeah. Colin can do no wrong in her eyes, which will soon change. Mm. Also, maybe Penn is referencing the, the fact that her mom has been a bit of a copycat then. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. If she's just naming it after their family because That's true. the Bridgertons, mm. they're so popular, they could name a ball after themselves. Mm-hmm. Remember, that ball last week was so successful that make no wonder she wants to copy it well and do a better job copy it and do a better job <laughs> the ultimate one up and also in this scene Portia and cousin Jack Rington have like a conversation about Colin they talk about Mr. Bridgerton and how they're gonna take his money or not take his money <laughs> mm-hmm. we don't cut to pen at this point I'd like to see like if she's even you know a bit concerned about what they're talking about and, like... just goes straight over her head she has no yeah. idea <laughs> yeah well I think that also at this point in the story she also has trust in cousin Jack because as we'll see mm-hmm. next episode we'll see that Penn looks actually shocked and devastated when she realizes the extent of Cousin yeah. Jack's scheming Yeah. so I think she had a lot of trust in him and oh. probably wasn't thinking about that here because yeah. if you think about last episode also um, when Colin was telling Penn that he was thinking about investing and didn't want her to tell Anthony and everything she was kind yeah. of excited about the idea of their families being united yeah, in that way true. so I don't think this would set off alarm balls for her yet yeah she doesn't want to rock the boat with them <laughs> Yeah. anyway Penn's got enough to worry about hasn't she but we've got room one place. Can we go see where my lovely Colin is? If we pop across the square, we find him sat reading a newspaper in the drawing room, surrounded by various letters of the alphabet. But who is actually sat next to him, Lecky? Hear ye, hear ye, Bridgerton fans. Our moment has finally come at last. As a proud member of the Biscuit Cushion Society for the elevation of Colin's biscuits and other lovingly supported objects, <laughs> I am delighted to inform you that Colin's favorite plate elevator has finally made an appearance. Nestled next to our favorite Bridgerton, we see a plate of biscuits and I think strawberries perched on not one, but two cushions. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the one on the top has captured the heart of the entire fandom. Please let me exaggerate here. But I just love this plate. Blink and miss it character detail so much that foodie Colin may have created a pile of cushions to rest his plate upon. This is hilarious to me. Ah, biscuit cushion. My <laughs> beloved biscuit cushion. How's he looking, Veg? Biscuit cushion is looking absolutely <laughs> astonishing in a tasteful shade of Bridgerton blue <laughs> with a light oh. damask pattern running across him. Um, Classic As pattern. Lucky pointed out last week, Colin showed fondness for curtain tassels and his best friend, <laughs> the biscuit cushion, is also embellished with much the same. Same. This time, light gold, <laughs> dare we say yellow? Or mm-hmm. is the cushion its own character in its own right and we don't even need to compare it to Pen? <laughs> Who is she? Who is she? I'm not interested. Who's from Alfie Featherington? Anyway. It's anyway. all about biscuit cushion. For those of you who really have no idea what the fuck we're talking about <laughs> and why we talk about biscuit cushion so much, very briefly, like I say, we've been very bored in the past 18 months and we had a game on the sub <laughs> to decide our favourite object. We mentioned we mentioned the contender earlier in the season and in the final, it was the bench that Colin sits on during the fencing scene up against this 
biscuit cushion that he lovingly rests <laughs> his plate of biscuits on. And we genuinely nearly lost friendships over this. It's true. <laughs> We fought to the bitter end. Insults were thrown. Memes were sent. Propaganda was made. It was so bizarre. Yeah. I know. So I was on holiday. I had just started to get onto the subreddit and like start mm-hmm. chatting to you guys. Then I fucked off to Texas to visit my old uni. All hell broke loose. Came back and suddenly there were t-shirts. There were <laughs> mugs. Yes. There were like... <laughs> I was like, what has happened? It ended up somehow becoming like a charity fundraiser. Yeah. <laughs> and we we made biscuit cushion t-shirts. I have a biscuit cushion cushion. Yeah. And the opposition had a mug. So I have yep. a Collins bench mug. Yeah. But thankfully, we were all on the side of righteousness and good. And we recognised the true saviour of the season, the true epitome of all that is good in pollen is biscuit cushion. Yes. Isn't that right? To be immortalised forever in Halls of Fame. Well... Bay. What? Well, <gasps> what? I I was a bench baby. I'm still a bench baby. Fuck off. Get out. <laughs> Are you joking? Like you can be a a bencher, a benchist, a bench but, baby. But, but but number one is biscuit cushion. We've already settled this. It won. It won. <laughs> democratically through a voting system. Well, yeah, it's been settled. But like my heart is with the benches. But you know what? I extend my olive branch a little bit because I decided when I'm ready to adopt a cat cat again adopt don't mm. shop bitches we love you, Turkey. Mm. i'm gonna name him or her biscuit so Aww. i love this i love this idea and then you this can put adorable. biscuit on a cushion what? yes how funny yes. would it be though if you got another cat called bench that's what i'm gonna do i was just <laughs> oh my god stop it do it <laughs> little bench you're gonna biscuit and bench but all season we've said how lint newton committed himself to delivering on the fan request to have colin eating mm-hmm. and there is nothing more beautiful than the character choice of lovingly <laughs> place in a pile of biscuits on not one but two cushions the biscuit cushion was placed on a cushion that's how important biscuit cushion is it gets <laughs> yes. its own cushion and all of this may sound ridiculous and incredibly inconsequential but dear listeners ask yourself this vital question if this is how well colin treats a plate of biscuits consider how well he will treat penelope under similar circumstances <laughs> yes if you've read the second epilogue you know exactly what I'm talking about. You already have your answer. You know a cushion is important. So this <laughs> is vital analysis. <laughs> but since Biscuit Cushion is lovingly nestled next to Colin, Veg, you might as well let us know how you know the other the other guy is looking. <laughs> oh, sure. So Biscuit Cushion's best friend Colin Bridgerton is back <laughs> in his usual family time vibe. Baby blue, roughly cream cravat. We have seen this for a few episodes in a row, I think. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Oh, getting all nostalgic. Yes, I believe this is the same outfit he wears in the Feeding the Ducks scene. Yeah, he does bring it. He's only got the one one or two coats oh, yeah. in Baby Blue. He's on a budget. We've had our ups and downs with Baby Blue Colin, haven't we? Romney Hall, anyone? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't I remember that. And we know from Nicola that Colin is going to have done some growing up by the next time we see him. And, you know, we also know from Pirate Colin, right? You know? <laughs> we know about it. He's got the lead dark colours. He ain't got no Baby Blue. So much like Yellow Pen, it seems like we're approaching our final few scenes with Baby Blue Colin. What a journey, guys. Aww, Shed a tear. R.I.P., yeah. but thank you. <laughs> Definitely less sad about this. <laughs> Thank you for your service. It's time to go to the tailor in the sky now. And of course, he's matching little Gregory here. This contrasts a lot with the darker blue and black shades that Anthony and Benedict wearing, whereas Gregory is also in the baby blue. And to actually delve into what is going on in this scene, apologies listeners, <laughs> while discussing the upcoming Featherington Ball and the family's lowered social standing, a relieved Violet remarks that at least Lady Whistledown hasn't written about the scandal, and Colin responds by addressing Elle and rather pointedly remarks, Lady Whistledown does not seem to be writing at all anymore, isn't that right, Elle? Again, yeah. perhaps hinting that Colin still suspects that mm-hmm. his sibling may be the gossip writer. Yeah. Yes, big time. Yeah, there's definitely a bite to his words. And I always feel really bad for Eloise because she Aww. looks like she's about to start crying. Do you know when do you know when someone makes a dig at you and you normally have a very banter relationship but you feel them a bit <laughs> and it hits a certain way and you're like, that actually wasn't funny. <laughs> oh, poor Elle. Violet tries to comfort her by suggesting that she go hang out with Penelope. But Elle says that being seen around her is the last thing that Pen needs. Elle's scandal is bad and both she and the Featheringtons know it, even if Violet is trying to downplay it. But before we can dwell too much, Anthony 
and he storms into the room. He's upset about Kate, but handling it in his classic way by taking it out on his siblings. <sighs> and poor Colin is the one to cop for it first as Anthony asks if there's anything that Colin needs to share with him before berating him for taking a rather large amount of money out of the accounts without informing him. If you remember from 207, this is exactly what Colin wanted to avoid because he probably knew he'd get this exact kind of reaction from Anthony and end up being treated like a child. This is the exact season one mm-hmm. dynamic that we returned to here with Anthony yeah. treating Colin like a kid, Colin reacting against it. It always gets his back up and it's very uncomfortable for everyone. We also see this in the blocking of the scene because mm-hmm. Colin and Gregory are positioned on one side of the scene, on one side of the frame. They're both also in the that, the baby blue tones that Veg told us about, but Antony and Benedict mm-hmm. are on the other side of the room kind of faced against Colin, both of his older brothers. Yeah. There's like this divide between the older brothers and the younger brothers that we see on camera. Mm-hmm. Colin again treating like getting treated like a child and there's that gorgeous shot where when Colin is being told off Greg is perfectly framed mm-hmm. in the shot with him yes exactly emphasizing how Anthony is really treating him like he would mm-hmm. Gregory but it's one of my favorite shots Colin reading his paper with his little mini me next to him and there's an <laughs> awkward moment where the rest of the family all look at Colin and it's so embarrassing for him he has to uncomfortably defend himself by saying he's been exploring investment with Lord Featherington Mm-hmm. His siblings are on Colin's side, though, with Ben pointing out that he is one in 20, adding to the deep confusion of when Colin's birthday is, but we'll get to that another day. And Elle saying, there's no one in this family allowed to make their own decisions. Anthony Mood clears the room in seconds, though not before a sarcastic Colin assures Anthony he'll keep him informed of his every move. Can we get in on that too, Colin? Because it would make our lives <laughs> much easier if we were informed of your every move as well. Yes, as someone who has recently had to deal with ambiguity from men, I fucking hate it. Don't be ambiguous. <laughs> Just be straightforward. <laughs> yeah, I think Colin could learn that as well. So while Elle reignites her search for Lady Whistledown after receiving a note and a clue from Theo, learning Lady Whistledown has been smuggling her issues to the printer shop in Silks, over at the palace, we find Queen Charlotte in desperate need of stimulating conversation now that Lady Whistledown has ceased publishing, and she's clearly hoping that Lady Danbury can help fill that void. She asks Lady Danbury if she thinks anyone else is bound for the Isle. To me, this again suggests that Queen Charlotte will not only allow Penn to keep publishing at the end of season three, but will also allow her to walk down the with her one true love or you know remain alive and with her one true love if they're already (laughs) married by then because queen charlotte is a romantic and she picks up on five little five oh that's right she does yeah is miss goring the harpist then yeah no she is yeah Yeah. telling you now this is the true love story of the show and we're all missing it because we're all paying attention to these two (laughs) that keep us clowning yeah, it's a bit boring, isn't it, without uh, Lady Whistledown, isn't it, Queen? So, you know, watch what you do next year because you're going to regret it, babe. <laughs> That's all well and good, but we need to go have a drink. Let's go hang out with Will and the boys. What's going on over there? So Colin is over at Mondridge's digging for information. He seems to be doing some academic research as he asks Cousin Jack where exactly his minds are located. Oh. Why exactly? I'm sure we'll find out next week. What yeah. a scholar. Yeah, where are these minds then? He asks, which is setting up one of the best lines of the show, which we will get to in yep. part two. Mm-hmm. Oh, are we watching? Preach. All academic pursuits are abandoned, however, when Will tries to tip off Colin about the scheme, remarking that Cousin Jack and the late Archibald Featherington are both swindlers. Hero Colin, of course, leaps to his feet to defend the Featheringtons upon hearing this slander, passionately declaring that the Featheringtons are a fine family. Can't wait until Colin hears of how Portia has tried to ruin his life for two seasons, but I'm sure he'll be so blissfully happy with Penn he won't care much. Lucky, did you literally not just listen to a word Colin said? Leave Portia the fuck out of it. She is a fine woman from a fine family. You should be very careful of the accusations you make against Portia. Mostly because I think beans will start on you. (laughs) Colin is not standing for any Featherington slander and he is not going to listen to anyone dragging their reputations in public. As we'll find out at the end of 208, that's something Colin prefers to do himself. And what we'll later find out is that Colin was faking his anger towards Will here. He'll say it was all a ploy, something he needed to do to gain Jack's trust. And I think I was definitely fooled when I watched this to start with I was surprised at how angry Colin got with Will as well like even with Marina all we got from him was a wounded like oh you're a cool woman indeed but here he's like going for it Mm. it's like Colin what's happened is it because he's wound up by Anthony and like now when you look back you can see it wasn't genuine but in the moment it's quite intense but I guess the boy's acting. I feel like the only other time we see that intensity from him is when Antony is digging about the engagement with Marina and he bursts out of his chair and he's like, enough! In season one, and that's 
does like to burst out of a chair, doesn't he? (laughs) (laughs) Will we see that in season three? Who knows? Well, that's the thing, though, because Book Colin has a temper, doesn't he, that takes everyone by surprise because they always see him as really... So, Veg, you you fell for it too. Um, What's he going to be like if someone else insults Pen and genuinely gets mad? What's he going to do to himself when he finds out that he insulted Pen? He's going to have to punch himself in the mirror. Uh, But sign me up. The anger might have been a facade, but it didn't take much work to jump into the role of Featherington Defender of Honour. But the real question then becomes, and I don't know if I have the answer to this, when did Colin actually begin to suspect that the mines were fraud? Because it's a bit ambiguous. So your options are... He either maybe suspected it straight away, from maybe from that first time that Penn told him about the flourishing mines in America back in 205 during the duck scene, mm-hmm. or he maybe began to suspect just after that and he decided to play along with it a little bit more to find out if his suspicions were true, do a little bit more digging like he is here, or did he actually have no idea until this very moment when will put the suspicion into his head i suppose the redeeming part about him only finding out in this particular moment is that it shows how quick he is in measuring up the situation and faking a reaction he's very cunning and quick thinking if it was this situation but when do you think he found out or when do you think he began to suspect that something was a bit fishy maybe right away i want the show to err on the side of showing that colin is cunning and kind of quick-witted like you said Mm -hmm. but i think the setup from last episode where we saw that conversation about how Jack found the mines while hunting. I feel like Colin was at least tipped off there. Probably. If not before. Because Mm -hmm. who the fuck goes hunting and then stumbles upon a fucking ruby (laughs) mine or whatever. Uh, Me, last week. (laughs) (laughs) So, and also I feel like Colin is intelligent enough that he may have picked up on something before now. That's a good point, Lecky, because when he's been digging into the mines, because we saw it last episode, like you say, he's not asking like, oh, how profitable are they going to be? both times the conversations have been where are these mines then or asking yeah. about their location and True. and I think that he is trying to get that piece of information to gauge he knows that something's up with it yeah. Yeah. and if he wasn't suspicious then why wouldn't he just invested straight away mm-hmm. like why is he being so hesitant and right. and I also personally really want him to have figured it out for himself earlier on because I really don't want this to be the second season running where Colin walks into a Featherington trap we just need a little bit yeah. more growth from him. Also, something that we didn't mention last week in the last episode, Colin calls Jack a jack of all trades, where yes. he, it's almost like he's steadily calling him out on his bullshit a little mm-hmm. bit, kind of digging a jack for being a jack of all trades, but a master of none. Yeah. And that supports the idea that he may already have been suspicious, especially combined with him asking about the mine's location that he again asks about here. So he may have already known or yeah. at least suspected. And it's possible that everything that we We've seen in the last few episodes has just been a pretense for him to learn more about the scheme. I like the idea that he was already suspicious that he heard what Penn said about the mines in America and he just started quietly digging in because that yeah. that then ties into his suspicions of Eloise, how he right. keeps his suspicions quieter and waits and watches and gathers information. Um, yeah. I yeah. suppose the one hang up on this whole thing though is he did withdraw the money. Yeah. We don't know if he gave them money. Yes. Because Cousin Jack later, he returns home and speaks with Portia and he says, Colin Bridgerton has taken the bait. And I feel like that could reference either Colin finally investing the money or just this scene here where Colin seems to mm-hmm. kind of fall into his trap. Yeah. So I feel like yeah. Colin taking the bait could just be, he believes the scheme he's going to invest, but hasn't invested yet. Right. So why did he take the money out if he always knew that it was a fraud? Maybe to make it seem like it was... He was serious like he was gonna show yeah. cousin jack like oh i have the money or whatever yeah maybe like a receipt being like yeah that would make sense like i have it for you if you're ready and so it seems like it's like legit and then like cousin jack would get back to him or something you know um if we're going mm-hmm. that way because colin is observant yeah i like the idea that he already had the suspicions in his mind and then will gave that final piece yeah mm-hmm. and confirmed it for him yeah and he and the confrontation with will although it hurt will and colin was upset about it this confrontation gave colin a setup to really put on a show and yeah. be more convincing that he'd fallen for it right yeah but uh, colin has heroically defended penelope sorry i mean the featherington's honor <sighs> at the cost of being uncharacteristically harsh towards will but don't worry will he'll make it up to you later so all is right in the world we can all sleep well tonight safe in the knowledge that nobody's out there dragging penelope in public <laughs> Good job, Colin. Keep at it. 10 out of 10. (laughs) Yay. 
Despite Will's warnings, Cousin Jack returns home and informs Portia that Colin has taken the bait, as we just mentioned, and after coming to a worrying realization about what it will mean to have swindled every family of means in the town, Portia drags her family mm-hmm. to the Modis shop the next day, and they're beaten there by Eloise, who has an issue of Lady Whistledown tucked under her arm, and she confronts a very flustered Jen, revealing that she thinks the modiste is Lady Whistledown's accomplice. Covering for mm-hmm. herself, Genevieve declares that associating with the gossip writer would be foolish. This, to me, again, hints that Jen may think their relationship is too risky to continue in season three, possibly. Mm. Yes. Uh-oh. Eloise is starting to put the pieces together. Is that up in Eloise? Death knell, I hear tolling in the distance. Ding dong. Speaking of, <laughs> in walks our lovely pen, and she spots the tense moment between Jen and Elle, and she spots the whistle down that Eloise still has in her hand. Clearly, Eloise has not been put off her search by being ruined. What the hell is it going to take for Elle to give up the ghost? Yeah, and while Pen is a little distraught upon seeing Elle, she does look really pretty in one of her rare pink dresses. (laughs) This is a summary (laughs) of the last few episodes. She's stressed but beautiful. Yeah, (laughs) a great way to be. It's an interesting dress, actually. It's two pinks. We don't often get a couple of different Mm colours. And it's bright, it's fun, it's different. She also has a little butterfly reticule here as well. Always on brand. We saw her in pink when Eloise was visiting Theo and she was spying in her pink cape. And we also saw her in pink when she went over to the Bridgerton house to ask Elle where she'd been. Yeah, Mm -hmm. so she really contrasts Eloise. We've discussed it before as well that pink is used in the show as a way to represent Penelope's independence. So it's very fitting that this is the colour she's wearing as well as her sort of contrasting Eloise here. She's standing up to Eloise and it takes her by surprise. But it's almost identical to the dress from 203 with the butterflies on it, but it's just roses this time. And it's so pretty. I love this style of dress that they made for her. Yeah. Yeah. I personally would argue, in fact, that this dress is even more gorgeous than the one she wears to the Hearts and Flowers Ball. Wow. Mm. Get out of here. I love how soft her hair is as well. Elle gets Penn to meet her around the back of the shop. Remember, Portia doesn't want the two to be hanging out together because Eloise is ruined. And we follow the two sort of friends looking a bit tenuous outside. Eloise tells Penn that Theo has told her everything about Whistledown and shit because Penn realises that Elle is very close to figuring her out. Remember, she's just walked in and found her with Genevieve, her accomplice. Mm -hmm. What on earth is she going to do about Ilecki? Acting with the same recklessness we saw last episode where Penn assured Elle that Lady Whistledown's next issue would clear her name. Here, a panicked pen states that she's heard a rumor about Elle's association with Theo, all in a desperate attempt to convince Elle to again cease her search for Lady Whistledown. Mm -hmm. Pen is trying to get control of the situation, but her frustration really boils over as she says, you've been consumed by thoughts of her for far too long. First you love her, then you hate her. It is enough. I do not want to hear about it anymore. Pen has dug herself into this situation a little, I think, by spending Mm -hmm. the past two seasons enjoying Eloise's admiration, trying too often to retain her friend's interest yeah pandering to her yeah we started this season with Eloise not being interested in Whistledown yeah and Penelope really worked to win her favour back dragged her in yeah definitely and it's not so easy to put those worms back in the can is it Pen? I think it's because she desperately wants Elle's approval no matter what Mm -hmm. and that she got into her head for sure so she's like dealing with these emotions of well if Elle hates Lady Whistledown now that means she's going to hate me you know how you like get into that like Mm -hmm weird headspace with people where you're like am I being too much because somebody snapped at me or was it just like whatever mood that they were in you know I think that she's getting way too into her head because she so desperately just Mm -hmm. wants Elle to approve of her and of Lady Whistledown but now it's like every time she starts to dislike Lady Whistledown Penn's like oh no she's gonna hate me it doesn't make it okay I just mean that Penn has gotten herself into a little bit of a pickle yeah and it's so contrasting because she wants the love without Eloise trying to uncover Whistledown but for that for Eloise those two things are completely tied into each other if Eloise is interested in something she's going to pull and pull and pull until she gets the bottom of it yeah and Penn knows that about her best friend right Nicola described this season as the pride before the fall for Penelope and I think we're really starting to see that here as it's beginning to Mm -hmm. unravel for Penn even as she's desperately trying to keep all those threads from unraveling however she can yeah but just a question for you how do we feel about the way that Penelope treats Eloise in the scene there's a fascinating moment between the two where Eloise you know we've seen it before Eloise is always the louder one, the more assertive one of them. She talks over Penelope quite a lot. And she says in quite characteristic Eloise fashion, she says, you are not listening to me, to Penelope. But then Pen turns on her and shouts, do not scream at me. And it's this moment where it completely takes Eloise by surprise, seeing her friend not just assert herself like this, but really shout at Eloise and silence Eloise. And what do you also think of Pen's actions? Because Pen is lying here. There isn't a rumour going around about 
about Eloise and Theo. Mm -hmm. And she is, again, trying to sabotage quite a genuine relationship that her friend is going through for her own means. Yeah. And it's symptomatic of the way that Penelope has tried to manage or, you could argue, manipulate Eloise throughout the season. Um, I think that Pen was a little bit over the top. <laughs> She's panicking. She's, she's out of debt. Yeah, panicking. However, I feel like it was bad news for both of them because I feel like Elle should have then realized how Pen was reacting and been like, whoa, what's going on here? What's going yeah. on with you? But Eloise was like so wrapped up, which as she should be, it was a lot for her to deal with. Mm. But it was definitely mm -hmm. a moment because it was so uncharacteristic of Pen within their own relationship. And mm. when you're young, you don't realize these things. Like you take a lot of stuff to heart when a friend of yours is being like snippy or something or they're like snapping at you or they're not being how they normally are and typically that is a sign that something is deeper is going on and it doesn't necessarily mm. have to do with you i think a lot of pen's anger towards l is her own internal struggle with acceptance of herself mm. and acceptance of who lady whistledown is and she's taking a lot of the opinions of lady whistledown to mean like this is who she is as a person and so mm. it's you know it's pretty conflicting i i think that she was trying her best again i think she was exasperated she was yeah i've done all of this l to keep you from getting mm -hmm. hurt to keep you from keep like you safe i have done all these things to help you l doesn't know that though and yeah. she's like and to save your family from ruin because i care deeply about you and your brother mm -hmm. she's just not understanding why l won't let it go yeah yeah yeah. You have been given, that's her thing, you've been given freedom again. You don't have the queen tailing you or anything like that. You've been given this freedom to run and be safe. Why are you still trying to put yourself in harm's way? But Elle doesn't know that. Yeah. That's a really good yeah. point, Baines. Yeah, I feel like Penn's definitely at her wit's end here. And yeah. you can kind of see that in the comment she makes about how she's just looking forward to things returning to the way they used to be between them. Right. Yeah. Which is just so sad in retrospect because later Elle makes a very similar comment that she's just ready for things to go back to normal but then their friendship just ends up fracturing yeah. completely yeah yeah you're gonna be waiting a long time for that day pen it's a little bit naive of both of them too and it's kind of yeah. one of those things that you go through when you're growing up where things are like i want everything to stay the same because i'm comfortable mm -hmm. but that's just not how it works that's not how yeah. growing up works yeah things change you need to take risks sometimes or mm -hmm. take accountability in this case and you you can't micromanage someone like eloise like yeah. she just has an yeah. innate spirit within her that you can't contain right but it is that frustration of i'm doing this for you but i can't tell you that i'm doing this for you i think in like hindsight of the show if pen had just come out and said that she was lady whistledown in that moment mm -hmm. it could have been such an interesting yeah such an interesting story to tell yeah had the conflict been moved to that moment yeah yeah people have talked about this uh, there's a lot to be said about like if you admit something versus if you get found out it's so different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes exactly because if she just admitted it i think the fallout would yeah. have been nearly as bad yeah it's definitely. a constant lie and it's that at this point Eloise hasn't been manipulated into giving her relationship with Theo up right yeah Lekki you've said this throughout the season about you've been tracking the way that Penn has been slipping up very slowly she's been getting ahead of herself and beans what you say had Eloise been paying attention to what was going on with uh, with Penn in this moment like yeah. why is she acting so strange Penn is giving loads of clues yeah mm -hmm. and she's not picking up but that moment is coming for Eloise because when Eloise stops and takes a, a minute to actually listen yeah the minute that Eloise steps back and actually listens to her friend to what Penn is saying is the moment. exactly mm -hmm. that's when it spells doom for her but we're not quite there just yet Penn flounces off and leaves Eloise behind her shocked by her friend's demeanor and really confused as she'll tell Ben later Eloise thinks that Penn finds her ridiculous if only you knew what was going on Elle on the plus side soon you will so you know silver linings and all there's lots of ends in the show Pen, Ben Jen Pen, Ben Jen Pen, Ben Jen Pen, Pen, Ben Pen, Pen, Ben Pen, Pen, Jen Jen, Jen also we call them Ben and Jen and they've never been called that in the show yeah no <laughs> Ignoring Penn's warnings, Elle pours over issues of Lady Whistledown with Theo, who speculates that the other modiste could have possibly been Lady Whistledown's accomplice, as if it wasn't enough to have been driven out of business by Lady Whistledown, but now she's also being accused of aiding and abetting her. My word. Poor, innocent, ruined modiste. Not long for this world. <laughs> well, she's not going to die. She's just been driven out of town. I wonder where she went. Vienna. Did she go back to Vienna? Yeah, her visa ran out. Dream on, but don't imagine they'll all come come true Ooh, when will you realize 
The Hannah waits for you. Well, goodbye, poor innocent Rumidis. We will miss you. Good luck in continental Europe. Um, and goodbye to Theo and Eloise's friendship. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. And goodbye to Theo and Eloise's friendship, which ends in a rather dramatic fashion after Eloise has ruminated on Penelope's words. But mm-hmm. what I really like about this exchange between Eloise and Theo is that they almost kiss and Eloise is the one who pulls back. I feel like with every Bridgerton that kind of introduce a love interest that isn't the right one and for Eloise it's Theo and she realizes it's not right and when she finally meets Philip and they have a moment where they nearly kiss kind of like Colin and Marina they don't kiss I think that Eloise and Philip will kiss and will know that it's right devil's advocate was that Penelope's voice stopping her though maybe <sighs> I don't, you don't, I don't look know. too high about that well I don't know I was thinking about Philip a couple times throughout this episode and how their season might play out and I and I just I like that Eloise is the one who pulls back here because mm-hmm. yeah She's open to love. She realizes that romance could be for her, but Theo is not not the person, even with these extenuating circumstances. Later, we find a moody pen rifling through some of her Lady Whistledown earnings in her bedroom, perhaps wondering if she could have profited more by driving poor innocent Modis out of business. Mikey, who's side are you on here? <laughs> oh, God. Lord help us. Yes, yes, yes. We join Pen in her bedroom, as Lucky mentioned. She looks gorgeous. Gorgeous but miserable, as we have said. That seems to be the theme for today's episode. So she changes into another dress here. She's really keeping me busy. She's actually wearing yeah. a beautiful butterfly applique dress that we mentioned earlier. And we first glimpsed that in 203. Beans! Reduce! Reuse! Recycle! Ooh. Oh my god. That might be the last reduce, reuse, recycle I know, of the series, I was just you know? thinking. Oh my god, I hope they like reuse some in series three. They've got to, sure. Oh, we know they do. We saw it filmed. We know they're doing one in season three. We're in the clear. <laughs> It's one of our favourites though, so it's nice that we get one little last look. Yes, especially love that dress. Nice to have a little reprise of it here now. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, (gasps) big moment. It's finally time for our last ball of the season. We've been through highs and lows (laughs) and the last ball that exists currently, except for all the balls that exist on someone's hard drive over at Shondaland. Are we all ready? Because it's going to be a big one. This is a ball that goes on and on. It goes on for so long that we're splitting the episode. (laughs) Not just yet though. The good news is that I'm sure this ball will go just splendidly. Let's go get started. Our lovely Colin arrives at Featherington House with the rest of his family. He needs no directions because this place is our home from home for this boy. (laughs) Yeah, and Colin is in his classic I'm at a formal event look. (laughs) Style icon Colin Bridgerton. (laughs) I think much like every man in the world, they have one suit, right? They (laughs) do, yeah. Nothing's changed in 200 years. As long as it fits well and is tailored, I still go for it every time, (laughs) BB. The one my heart I've seen, his suit looked really good. Really good. Oh, 108. That was my hardest. That's his best ball look, I think. Yeah. yeah. So this is his classic look. He's wearing the dark suit, cream shirt, cream cravat. Also, cousin Jackerington, which I'm quite sad has not caught on with any of the rest <laughs> of you, just me. Oh, I thought it was your bit. I didn't want to step on your toes. <laughs> Stop trying to make cousin Jackerington happen. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so they are quite matchy matchy, and we've talked about the whole will mm-hmm. Colin be the next Lord Featherington theory. And I did start to go down the rabbit hole but then it switched to a view of the ballroom and I realised like every man is dressed like that but you know (laughs) we'll take it a girl can spiral and a little shout out to the swoopy curl at the front of his hair favourite thing we're not just losing baby blue Colin we've got to spare a thought for his season 2 hairstyle as well which is cute it was like so different to the season one. I loved it. It's my favourite. He's going on such a hair journey through these three series. Season two was shorter than season one ship's prow and no sideburns. And soon we're going to trade it in again. He's going to be growing those bad boys. Yeah, sideburns, flowy locks. Oh, can't wait. I will miss season two, Colin. He's my favourite. I love all of his hairstyles, so they all rank highly with me. Season two, Colin, is the best, but I I love his styling in every season, and I can't wait to see how they style him in season three. Amen. I assume Penn's kicking around here somewhere. Have you seen it all, Lek? Yes. So, as the musicians make the rounds on a rather cool moving platform, we see Penn listening to gossip as she makes her own rounds through the crowd, and she laughs to herself when she overhears two footmen gossiping that Five took a lady friend, Miss Goring, into a 
closet for 20 minutes. We'll see if Penn feels similarly amused after being dragged away by Colin Bridgerton for a moment alone later this episode, but also, shouldn't so-called nice guy Fife do the right thing and propose to Miss Goring? Will he marry in season three? Surely, to remain a nice guy, he has to do the honorable thing. Right, Obs? I am sick to death of this slander. I hear it all the time. It's like proof that Fife is this horrible man is that he took Miss Goring into a closet for 20 minutes. First of all, I think she has independent agency. I think she happily went into that closet and had yeah, a great- two people went into that closet. Yeah, two people went into that closet. Also, 20 minutes, you know, it's not too bad, not too bad going. And I just want to say that later on- I think if this was Colin- This is a thing, Veg, this is a thing. Later on in 208, we see Colin lead Penn into a closed room. And what do we do? We clap along, we cheer, we wave our little pathetic (laughs) Colin flags. And in the same breath, we class Fife as a villain. How do you know that he's not in the middle of his own sweeping love story? The Queen earlier was asking if they're going to get married. How do you know that he wasn't giving her a geography lesson? (laughs) Maybe she was in there learning about the, I don't know, the diamond mines of Russia. (laughs) And here you are slandering, insinuating that he was up to no good. And you know what? If he was up to no good with her, then at least Miss Goring got some because Penn sure as hell didn't this episode, did she? I know who I'd rather be in the situation. Well, she definitely did because she adjusts the tissues in her dress later when Penn is talking about her. What did Penn get? A lecture about fucking Georgia. (laughs) I know where I'd rather be, that's all I'm saying. And I'm sick of this slander. How do you know he's not going to propose? I don't. I'm asking. I'm asking. Did Colin propose after he took her into a private room? Is that what he did? Or did he stand there and drag her in public? I just said, will they marry? Okay, hey, Queen Charlotte (laughs) also is curious. Will Fife marry? Is he going to marry Miss Goring? I'm just stating what the Queen has already stated. Nah, he's a fuck boy. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus Christ. But he's our Miss Fuck Boy. So before the night all goes to complete shit for Penn, let's take a look at her final season two outfit. Oh, it's been a journey, guys. And the last yellow, probably. Moment of silence for the yellow. (laughs) Choir music. (gasps) Get a candle. The yellow is all yellow. (laughs) Look at the stars. Look how they shine for you. And it was all yellow. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yellow, the Water Barb podcast version, will be released in the coming weeks. <laughs> Thank you, Chris Martin, for giving us the license. <laughs> <laughs> was that a sufficient tribute for you, Veg? Yes, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beans. This is the culmination, guys, of the whole two series. We've <laughs> this is what it's been building up to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is the culmination, guys, of two series of outfits. Appliques, bows. Yeah, we've heard Nick, the cast and the crew. They've talked about Penn's journey through the season, growing up with her colour palette and her hair. They made the curls looser. They made the dresses a bit less yellow. And yeah, so her dress, it's delicately beaded, but it's yellow again. But to be honest, she seems bolder and more at home in it. She feels confident. She's in her own house, her own domain. Her citrus <laughs> family are back on the social ladder. This is the Featherington ball, damn it. If she wants to wear yellow, she will wear yellow. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I should have worn yellow. I wore pink instead. Oh, so you're independent. You're independent. I'm an independent pen. So the golden yellow dress is embroidered with tulips. Mm -hmm. We know they symbolize passion. And this seems to be another sneaky clue that the costume designers snuck in to suggest pollen might be season three. So if you recall from our season one rewatch, Violet embroiders tulips for Daphne and explains to Anthony that they symbolize passion. Mm -hmm. And earlier in this very episode, we see Anthony delivering a bouquet of tulips to Kate. And now we see them on Penn's dress. <laughs> Hinting love mm-hmm. is in her future. <laughs> Just not this episode. It does make me laugh though, because it really shows how it's it's really typified when he drags her into the room later on. Because her mindset is like passion. Yeah. This is the night. Yeah. This is the moment. This is what it's all been building to. I'm about to go to third base. And he just mm-hmm. drags her in public instead. Sometimes that's how a night goes, isn't it? Yeah. And on a lighter note, this big style of her hair reminds me of Gretchen mm. and Mean Girl. Do you remember? Her, <laughs> why is her hair so big? It's a ball of secrets. 
Yes. And this look marks the end of Penn's season two hair journey. Oh. Mm. This updo is pretty unusual for her. She usually has her hair partially down and we even at balls. And interestingly, this is a completely different look. We haven't seen this hairstyle before. She's almost got like a beehive. Mm-hmm. And we've seen and heard a lot from in interviews and stuff about the hair going on a looser journey. But in this ball, it seems to reflect that Penn's desire to be or eventually her journey to become mm-hmm. a Bridgerton and how she feels that that's going pretty well for her at the moment and it's especially <laughs> apparent when we see Penn and Elle together because they have very similar yes. updos with the same tendrils mm-hmm. of hair framing mm-hmm. their face but Penn's hair does have a lot more height to it which screams Portia's influence yep. it's the Featherington mm-hmm. ball after all and Portia has yeah. a similar tall <laughs> hairstyle with a lot yes. of height to it <laughs> That is defying gravity like Alphaba. And as we inch closer to the demise of their friendship, Elle finds Pen in the oh, crowd and not only <laughs> and not only thanks her visibly guilty friend for protecting her, but also for being a true friend. And Elle takes a cue from Pen, who earlier um, said she looked forward to things returning to normal between them by declaring that she's ready to speak of something other than Lady Whistledown. And here is where Pen makes a grave error. Perhaps because she's given up Lady Whistledown, maybe mm. there are all sorts of barbs and quips swirling in her head and she doesn't really have an outlet for them anymore but Penn uses mm. her, her Lady Whistledown voice with Elle here and shares the gossip she's heard about Lord Fife and Miss Goring. Sadly Elle notes this keen observation and begins to view her friend in a new light though Penn is completely oblivious. I just have to say I absolutely love the way that this is shot. I think it's so relatable because you, like you say Penn is completely oblivious. She's happy to be with her best friend again but the camera slowly moves into Eloise's face and I think perfect acting from Claudia Jesse here because you can see mm-hmm. the cogs clicking yes. and everything going and I think we've all had that moment in life. Do you know when you find something out and the world just completely drops out from under you? Shifts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and everything just kind of turns and you can see the blood drain from her face and she's still arm in arm with Penelope. She doesn't have this Mm -hmm. huge explosion. She just has this quiet moment where it all finally hits her. But we don't have any time to process what's happened because Chaos Colin has entered the chat. Prepare yourself because everything he does from this moment on right through to our rewatch next episode is just one chaotic move after the next because much to our horror <laughs> especially pens we find that the third born son is dancing with none other than Cressida Cowper what the fuck is going on Lecky why the hell is he dancing with her well I know Penn isn't too thrilled about it but I'm too busy enjoying the dancing to worry too much about how she feels here Ugh. because hat tip to Jack Murphy for all of the phenomenal dances and choreography that we see in this particular episode but I just yeah. love the little hoppy dance that Colin does with Cressida here they're like hopping a across the ballroom I find this moment completely adorable (laughs) I don't even care that he's with Cressida and just as a scandalous point here (laughs) if you'll give me a safe space to speak for a second I also love Cressida's dress it's just this pretty green color and it's covered in these beautiful flowers I'm so sorry how dare you I had no idea that we had a secret Colin and Cressida shipper on the pod don't ship them it's just a pretty dress we need some sort of (laughs) exorcism to take place the power of Christ compels you to shut up that other moment Modiste is really doing her job well. Yeah. Yeah, was this dress made by the other Modiste or did Jen make this one? I'm just curious because it's very pretty. <gasps> because if yeah. it was made by the other Modiste, Jen's got to run for her money. It's mm-hmm. probably good that she was yep. run out of town. <laughs> I've got to say, I'm with Penn, who has stood there watching Colin with an absolutely murderous expression on her face. If looks could kill, Gregory would suddenly be moving up a spot in that line of succession. <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible turn of events of Penn. The good news is that at least she knows that her night couldn't possibly get worse than seeing the love of her life dancing with her arch enemy. Yeah, she's far from thrilled and Pollen fans are left in complete confusion. But fear not, because then it happens. The look, Colin, as per usual, senses Aww. Penn's presence and locks eyes with her where she's standing on the edge of the dance floor. And I have a question for you. Later in this episode, we learn that Colin has spent hours rehearsing a speech about Cousin Jack's scheme. Do you think he was imagining that Penn would be there when he delivered it? Because is he thinking about this now, I wonder? Hmm. The thing that makes me, that always gets me with Colin is why on earth did he A, have to tell Penn about the Mm -hmm. plan in the first place and B, choose this moment to tell her. I think he's been thinking about her all day. Mm -hmm. He's been rehearsing for hours. Mm, He's thinking about how he's going to make the speech to her, but also to Cousin Jack at the same time. But I feel like she is the audience he had in mind. So why does he need to tell her right now? There's there's nothing like pressing that he needs to deal with it tonight, is there? I wonder if it's like him trying to give back from when Penn tried to warn him about Marina. 
yes. Oh, yeah. I think we touched on that earlier this season that I feel like he wants to repay that. And be like, I'm looking out for you. I'm telling you everything. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult... God, there's always a bloody Featherington cousin (laughs) that they need to have a deep, meaningful chat about. I think he spent all day thinking of it. And he's like, I'm going to do her proud. I'm going to... Well, he's going to do the Featheringtons proud. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me correct the record. He probably imagined her standing there in her exquisite fake ruby necklace, listening to him (laughs) give this speech. And he would just gently unclasp it with one hand and like show her that it's fake. I adore the way that Colin looks at her in this moment. It's like he's trying to reach out to her and assure Mm -hmm. her that everything's okay. This dynamic of silent pulling glances across the ballroom where they're having this conversation, covert communication between them that only the two of them understands. That's exactly what we want. Get me a whole ton of them in season three, please. It really makes me laugh though because he's so calm and collected when and like centered when he looks at her. He's like, that's my true north. He's looking at her like, I've got it all under control. <laughs> yeah. Whereas she's absolutely seething at him. Yeah, she's furious. But the Colin we see in this scene is so charming. Obviously, he isn't actually trying to charm Cressida, but he's been very smooth. And as legions of Pollen fans faint at mm. Colin, definitely unclasping Cressida's ruby necklace with just one hand. A useful skill. <laughs> Where did you learn that skill? I just can't help but wonder what Chaos Colin did about this particular situation. Because here, Colin tells Cressida <laughs> that the Bridgerton valet has a way with jewelry, basically promising to return it with the fixed clasp, all before smashing it to pieces dramatically to make his feet. Yeah. <laughs> the implications of this are hilarious to me. So here's a question for you. What does Colin tell Cressida, if anything, about this ruined necklace? Surely, I guess he can just explain away, like, with the whole Featherington. Cousin Jack mm-hmm. stole it when he took, you know, when I revealed his scheme, he stole it and took off. But yeah, he didn't know that that would all go to plan like from his perspective he's just stolen a necklace well Colin says that he's going to keep it on the down low isn't he about Jack yeah so he's written himself into a corner because he can't tell everyone about the scheme so yeah so he just smashed it for seemingly no Mm -hmm. reason but logically I imagine that Colin would just blame his valet if he didn't forget about the situation entirely which is also possible I'll throw someone else under the bus I just imagine he'd be like oh yeah my valet skills have recently taken a sharp decline sorry about that but (laughs) Uh (laughs) but it'd also be funny to me if Chaos Colin just left the smashed necklace like in the Cowper's family carriage or something for them to find or maybe like in season one Cressida just stumbles upon the necklace by chance like she does with like Daphne's (laughs) discarded necklace only this one is just completely (laughs) smashed to pieces maybe that's why Cressida becomes the antagonist next season where we're like it's because she doesn't like Penn actually she's like bitch where's my necklace all she knows is that Colin maybe took Penn's hand disappeared with the necklace and they never saw it again if she witnessed oh, yeah. that moment anyway but you know my love of a good Colin gaze so I have to give a shout out to the second glance that mm-hmm. he gives over to Penn yes this is midway through the dance exactly as he says the line a gift from Lord Featherington and his his voice kind of yeah. has a little a little suave to it as he looks mm-hmm. over at Penn and I'm sure all this talk of rubies has got Colin thinking back to his own favorite necklace you know it's interesting that he didn't go around smashing that one isn't it <laughs> yeah he could have been like Penn you've got a ruby necklace can I borrow that? He likes to be dramatic. Yeah, yeah he, he does. This is the essential thing for season three. Chaos Colin yep. loves to be dramatic. He ain't going to be sat there being quiet and reserved. He's going to be all out chaos. Yeah, if you've ever seen like Nana Bananas fan art of like Chaos Colin, just like 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 yes. holding on to the bottom of Penn's dress that she's like dancing with another suitor, that's like, <laughs> the kind of drama. In the words of Luke Newton, we are not ready. His sneaky little look over to Penn is a really sweet way of him reaching mm. out to her again. Yeah. Uh, not that it reassures her that much, but he's like, I've got it all in hand. Don't worry, I'm coming over. He's charming. He's He's cunning. Mm-hmm. I want both traits in full force next season, especially yep. if he's bringing this energy to sabotaging suitors on a dance floor. <laughs> and the dance ends and Penn tragically looks down really sadly and she half-heartedly gives a clap. Yes, super awkward. But don't worry because Chaos Colin, having only just ended his dance with the thrilled Cressida, watch Cressida. She mm-hmm. goes back to her parents and she is so thrilled yeah. at what just happened. So don't worry, Penn, you're not the only one getting mixed signals <laughs> from uh, this man. Are we talking about me? <laughs> No, no, it's about Penn. No, it's about Penelope. Penelope. Oh, God. I'm so sorry. I was like, damn, because I am getting mixed signals. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I related to that line a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's been a tough week for everyone here at What a Barber Podcast. 
Chaos Colin, who's only just ended his dance with the thrilled Cressida, strides right over to her, slips his hand into Pen's, and delivers one of the best lines ever. Come with me. Can I ruin the mood by doing a Colin impression? Yeah. Of course you can. Great. <clears throat> Come with me. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you think he's from? I don't know. Doncaster. Come with me, love. <laughs> I don't know. It just came out. Okay. And the camera pans back up to Penn's face. She is glowing like the sun. The hope is in her eyes. Where is this man about to take her? That is where we're going to leave this episode. No! 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 no. <laughs> Grow up, you've already watched it about five million times. You know exactly what happens after this. But that is where we're ending it. But don't worry, because next week we'll be returning. And Lucky, I think uh, we're going to be grabbing our school books, aren't we? Mm-hmm. I think we've got a, a class to show up for next week. Yep, we've got something special planned for you. So make sure you bring a, a notepad, some pens. It may be educational. It was definitely going to be educational for Pen in many, many ways. <laughs> Lucky, I know that we're only halfway through this Mammoth episode, but yeah. come on, it's tradition. We've only got a couple of rewatches left. Do we have a whistle up and a whistle down for the episode? Yes, it's the biscuit cushion, of course. If you had, yes, it fucking is. If you had told me when I first became invested in the Bridgerton fandom that I'd be rooting for a happy ending for a pillow, I would have called you crazy. But I am now a proud member of the Biscuit Cushion Society for the elevation of Colin's biscuits and other lovingly supported objects. So there's that. Happens to us all at some point. Long live the biscuit cushion. <laughs> what about uh, a whistle down for the episode we're getting into it hasn't gone to complete shit yet but i'm sure there's some disaster we can pick up on yeah just any pen and l scene from from this this point in the episode forward their argument at the modi's shop is probably the the worst of the two um but yeah just any pen and l mm-hmm. scene cheerful cheerful stuff are we giving this a bow rating we might as well no i think in the interest Speaking as a data scientist, I think we need to be fair. We need to... Okay, I'll hold my reading. Okay. Full episodes. I have to say that if this was the actual end of the season, what a lovely ending. Penn thinks her friendship with Elle's restored. Yeah. Colin's just taken her hand <laughs> in his. I actually think we might as well just leave it here, to be honest. Yeah. Right. Yeah, this is like those TikToks where you, you play it and then so they slowly close the lid of the laptop. Like, <laughs> that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as much as I like their dance, just the image of him, like, taking her hand in a crowded ballroom and leading her away it's a good one (sighs) yeah it's a good moment and you know what we're not the only ones who spotted that next week we've got breakdowns of who saw what at the featherington ball diagrams Mm -hmm. we've got dances to be had we've got promises to be made and broken (laughs) within the space of about three minutes well done colin on that one babe yeah we've got uh dreams to be ruined fantasies to be had and a crying pen to finish the season on and potentially uh some tuba boy lore yay tuba boy. no we got some tuba boy for next week i do have some tuba boy lore yeah perfect oh i'm gosh. shocked i'm shocked to learn that you've got a tuba boy story for the episode where pen's life goes to shit i'm shocked that you'd find some sort of symmetry there's a tuba boy for every situation there is there is and that's beautiful maybe one day we can interview him <gasps> let's get him on the pod but until then, where can everyone find us, Lecky? You can find us at What a Barb Pod on Instagram and TikTok. And you can find us and lots of other lovely pollen fans on reddit.com forward slash r forward slash pollen Bridgerton. Beans, beautiful beans, who's distracted us this entire episode <laughs> by how good she looks. Can you see us out? Does a violin do 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 do